Pastor Tyler didn't know that we were going to do this, but we were already going to sing that chorus again. <laughs> Would you stand to your feet? Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name together. Glorify the Lord with me. Come exalt. praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness and let us exalt his name. almost redundant to say we need you. We need to take refuge in you because we do have trouble. Trouble that we've created for ourselves and trouble that is also out of our control. So God, by your spirit who lives in us, reveal to us the things that we've done that have brought pain and brokenness into our lives and to the lives of others. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we would learn to walk rightly in your paths and live in such a way that proclaims your coming kingdom. We know that we cannot do this on our own, so remind us, God, to take refuge in you, to trust you, to lean on you, to abide in you. We pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, Amen. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in the Lord. He's done great things, amen? Amen. Let's sing together. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you come. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance. 
sing your freedom, awaken the light. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm, you'll be faithful through
In the Church of the Nazarene, uh, one of our duties, and this is true of any church, is to raise up those who are called and to make help people be aware of the calling that God has on their life. And uh, sometimes that call looks like full-time ministry, sometimes that call looks like preaching, sometimes it looks like missionary service, sometimes it looks like uh, nonprofit, compassionate ministry type stuff. Uh, but it's our role as a church to raise up those that God is calling into ministry. We believe in the Church of the Nazarene that God calls by His Spirit. He gives the gifts that are necessary to live into a life of ministry. And so, just from my own experience, when God calls, we are not always willing right away. <laughs> Sometimes we like to run away. But this calling in response to it, to say, yes, Lord, I'll do what you're calling me to do, is the best choice we can ever make. In the Church of the Nazarene, our, our process is pretty particular. So first, when somebody expresses a call into ministry, uh, it requires that our local church, which would in turn lead to ordination in the Church of the Nazarene, it requires that our local church, being led by the church board, would embrace and and affirm the call that is on that individual's life. And we call that, when the, when the church board does that, when they look through the paperwork and see the testimony of the individual and know the life of the individual, they vote on whether they believe that God is calling this individual into ministry. And we, after doing so, after an affirmative vote, we hand out, we give a local minister's license. Now, that's the first step in the process. It's pretty long, this process. But the first step is this local minister's license, which we're going to give today. After that, you hold this local minister's license, and you become district licensed, which is the entire set of churches around us, which is 60-something uh, churches in western Michigan, says, you know what? We affirm. You go through interviews there, and they vote, and they say, we affirm the call of God on this individual's life to ministry. And so following that, the district license is given. Then after years of service and time and education being completed, ordination takes place, which is one of the most sacred acts we do in the Church of the Nazarene. When we say the Church of the Nazarene as a global entity is behind you, it's incredible. I'm thinking of the day when I knelt on that altar and the elders of the Church of the Nazarene in Chicago Central District laid their hands on me and said, you know what? We believe God has called you to do this work. Now go and do it. It's beautiful. But it starts on the local level, and that's what we're celebrating today. So I'm going to ask Liz to come up. Liz, aside from being a mother and being pregnant and doing the youth group and all of this other stuff, has been faithfully taking courses, and she has perceived the call of God on her life, as has uh, the local church board and many of you in this space, that God is at work in her and the Holy Spirit is working in her life, and she's responding and saying, yes, Lord, I'll do it. I don't understand it. <laughs> I just know the back end of the conversations on the other place. I don't know what it's going to turn into. I don't know what kind of stuff it's going to cause. We know, right? But I'm going to say yes. And so the church board voted earlier this year and said, you know what? We see that in her life as well. She's saying yes to the Lord. And she is, uh, we're, we're giving her, as Sparta Church of the Nazarene, her local minister's license for this year. Uh, congratulations. Great work. <laughs> she
She has like five classes left. She's been busting these things out. She's trying to get them done before the baby, or most of them done before the baby comes. So she's diligently working uh, and at the schoolwork as well. So thank you, local church, for supporting her and supporting us in her pursuit of ordination and God's call on her life as well. We don't know what it looks like. Lots of people ask that. We don't know what it looks like, but we're just happy to chase it down. So uh, at this point, as we prepare for prayer, I'm going to dismiss the kids to go with Miss Maxine. Um, she will have a wonderful time up there. Any kids that are joining her can go up with Miss Maxine at this point. They're all making their way there. And I call, t- call you now that are left in this space to the work of prayer. It's a work we do every single Sunday when we gather to intercede for those around us. It's a work that the church cannot neglect. We have to do this work. It's part of our sacred duty. And so if you would join me, either by kneeling at the altar or uh, kneeling in your seat or coming to the front row or standing or sitting, whatever posture you find necessary, join me in this work of prayer this morning. we give ourselves to you in these moments so that you could inform our prayers that you would lead us through this time and the words we utter with our lips the thoughts that we have the meditations on our heart they would be driven by you initiated by you and we would be simply responding to what you put into our hearts and minds as is our discipline we start by praying that you would by asking you to reveal those names and people that don't know your grace, that don't know you, that are living outside of a relationship with you right now. And help us to intercede for them once you put them on our hearts and minds. Help us as the church to pray in this way. God, may it be so that by your grace and by your mercy, these folks that have you put on our name, on our hearts and minds today would come to know you. May we be instruments of your grace and your mercy in their life. We continue by praying this morning for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Guyana. We confess that Sparta Naz is not all there is to the church and that your kingdom is breaking in all around the world. So help us as a church pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Guyana, interceding for them and the work they're doing to make disciples of all the nations. kingdom come in Guyana as it is in heaven. There are many around us, God, who are 
recovering from surgery, are still feeling the ailments of, of illness. We think of Les and Maxine. Think of Angie Tawney and others that will come to our hearts and minds. God, help us to intercede for them that through their illness, through their recovery, they would be drawn close to you. Help us as the church to pray. May your healing come. May your salvation be known through it. God, represented in this place are many prodigals. Those that once knew who you were, once lived in fellowship with you, but have since turned their back and walked away. holding out hope that they return someday. Help us to intercede for those in our lives, our kids, our grandkids, our siblings, our neighbors that have once known the faith but have turned away. Help us to pray. prodigals return to you. And when they come, when your grace wins, may we welcome them back with open arms. May we celebrate and rejoice that the one who was lost is now found. God, we've collected our tithes and offerings in this place today. And we entrust those to you, that you would use them for your kingdom purposes. Make us good stewards of everything that you've given to us. Help us to live with open hands, knowing that everything we have is from you. Now, together we pray those words, Jesus, that you taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm back from Maine, but I'm not preaching this morning, and I'm grateful for that because uh, the trip back, I did a stint where I slept for two hours out of 40, and so I'm, I'm recovering, but it's okay. But it, that's not the real reason why. The real reason why is because we would love to hear from Sam Metcalf before he goes off to college, so I'm inviting him up uh, this morning. He's going to preach for us today. Uh, I just want to say a few things. Uh, maybe a couple things. How thrilled I am that he's willing to say yes in this in this manner. Uh, he's going off to Hope College in just a week or so. Is that right? Two uh, weeks. My music culture is eleven days. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So he's going off to Hope College. Uh, he's preached once before at Muskegon Breakwater, but he I'm not going to ruin all of his story. Uh, I've been just taken back in my conversations with him about 
the heart that he has for the Lord and his tenderness to hear from the word and to dig deeper into it, to understand it, and then to teach it. Uh, at his school, he'd be teaching through FCA and all sorts of things like that, but uh, I'm just thrilled that we get to have this experience. One of the things that I told him, I know he's nervous right now uh, because you are the home crowd, uh, but one of the things I had told him as we were talking was that uh, you need to see the people, or what changed in my life when I was preaching, is to see the people as a people of grace, as a people of, uh, that love you and embrace you and are supporting you. So can you just all say, we love you, Sam, now, just to ease the tension? <laughs> all right, there we go. <laughs> uh, and that might, that probably won't help at all, but it is either way. Uh, I'm just thrilled that he said yes, and I'm thrilled that we can give him the opportunity. As we mentioned before with the local license, it is our job to foster. Uh, he's pursuing physical therapy. Uh, I've been in his ear about ministry. Don't worry about it, you know, so it's fine. But he's pursuing physical therapy, but it's our job as a local church to give opportunity for those that want to explore the things that God has for them. And so here, that, here we can be a part of that and partner with Sam and with God in what he's doing in Sam's life. So uh, let me pray for Sam and for the word that's going to be shared here this morning, uh, and then he'll bring the word for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Sam. We thank you for the work that you're doing in his life, and I pray that you ease any nerves that he has, ease any uh, tension that he's feeling, and just let him exhale the words that you've given him to speak. Allow him to remain faithful to what you've called him to say, and allow him to enjoy his time in the presence of you and the presence of his church family. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. If you don't already know me, my name is Sam Metcalf. Um, if you don't know me but you recognize me, I sit in that section every Sunday, and sometimes I'm in the booth. And if you don't recognize me from over there, if you have Mary Ellen Metcalf on Facebook, I am frequently on there a lot as well. <laughs> this spring, I recently graduated from Forest Hills Eastern High School. And this fall, I'm attending Hope College with the plan on majoring in physical therapy. Um, kind of context around that, when I was 16, um, in the spring of, I want to say 2022, I went to physical therapy for my left shoulder. And while I was there, um, I really enjoyed the presence of my physical therapist. I got to watch what he did with others while I was also working on my own shoulder. And so... Um, Kind of, it was in the middle of when we were trying to figure out what we wanted to be when we were older in high school. So I felt that um, physical therapy was a good profession to pursue, and it's still a great way to serve people in my community. So um, that's my plan this fall. I'm sure it will change, and I'm sure it's all going to be for the better and for God's plan, but that's the idea right now. In high school, I played football, track, tennis, and baseball. I enjoyed doing a lot of the um, sports and the extracurriculars. Um, some of the clubs I was part of were National Honor Society and, like Tyler mentioned, FCA, which is the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I will get more into that later when I share my testimony. But um, I just want to say thank you for having me. Thank you, Tyler, for calling to me to serve this Sunday. Um, just thank you again for listening to me. I'm uh, very nervous right now, so if I stutter, just please be with me. And my... Uh, I tend to get thirsty a lot, so I will be drinking a fair amount of water this, this morning. But I'm going to start with my testimony, and then we will shift gears after that into what God has laid on my heart to share with you this morning. So for all 18 years of my life, I have gone to this church. Um, I'm very and forever grateful that I got to grow up in a Christian household because I'm, I am friends with people that didn't grow up that way, and now they are that way, but some still aren't, and so I'm just forever grateful for my parents for um, allowing me to grow up in the, in the church. And growing up through um, elementary school and even the beginning of middle school, um, Sunday was church day, and church was not any other day after that. I was pretty shallow in my faith. Um, in the summers in elementary school and even middle school, I went to Indian Lake Nazarene Church Camp, and that was a, another great time for me to get deeper into my faith and my relationship with God. But still, when school started, Sunday was church, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday were how I wanted to live my life. Uh, fortunately, going into eighth grade, the summer going into eighth grade, I got to be a part of an um, amazing uh, camp group 
at Indian Lake, and I can say very firmly that I believe that that week and that summer at church camp at Indian Lake, I devoted my life to Christ. I Church after that didn't become a, a chore or a Sunday activity. It was more of a privilege and an opportunity to seek God further in my life. So leading into eighth grade, I was going deeper into my faith. But unfortunately, uh, at the end of my eighth grade year, COVID struck, and that meant that church was laying in my living room, still in my PJs every morning. Um, eventually, though, COVID ended, and we got to come back here. I got to continue to go deeper into my faith with God, but now ahead of me was high school, and high school is a challenging time for some people to stay, you know, um, have that relationship with God, but also carry that relationship into the school and the classroom. And so um, I was still living two separate lives. I was still living a, a godly life on Sunday and a church life. I was also living the way that I wanted to in high school. And so at the beginning of my sophomore year, I was invited to go to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, which is a club where um, high schoolers meet every Wednesday morning, and it's led by other high schoolers, and they share um, just a short 15-minute lesson before class starts. It's a good way to interact with other Christians in your school. If uh, you're you have kids, and that's a thing at your kids' school, and I encourage you to send them to it, because I enjoyed it. I loved the community, and FCA played a big role in my faith, which we will get into further um, into my testimony. But um, fast forwarding ahead to the summer leading into senior year, I had the opportunity to go on a trip with our youth group to Tampa Bay, Florida, for a trip called Nazarene Youth Conference. If you don't already know what that is, it's about a five- or six-day trip where we go— and we surround ourselves with other um, Christ-loving followers. Um, they say it's about 10,000 people there when we went. Um, I think it was more. I think it could not have been only 10,000. But either way, you understand just the uh, immense amount of community there. It was really strong. We got to listen to about five different speakers speak their testimony and their sermon over the five days. And at night, we got to go to concerts of some pretty popular artists. We got to listen to For King and Country, Zach Williams and Lecrae, and it was truly a life-changing experience. My faith had never been deeper after going on that trip. I encourage, again, if you have kids that at some point will have the opportunity to go to Nazarene Youth Conference, send them on the trip, figure out a way to get them on that trip, because it was honestly a life-changing experience, and you will not regret it if they do. After NYC, going into senior year, I was presented with the opportunity to lead FCA. So, like I said earlier, it played a big role and my faith and my relationship with God. So uh, I prayed about it. I prayed for guidance. I, I knew that I would regret saying no if I did. So I said yes to the opportunity. And so this last year, I got to not only be a part of FCA every Wednesday, but I got to lead it with um, four of my closest friends. And truly, like N NYC was, it's such a life-changing experience. Not only did it change my perspective on God, but just being up there and speaking to other kids that were my age and get, getting to connect with them through the word has allowed me to grow deeper and deeper and deeper into my faith. I'm very thankful for it. Having done that, this spring I was asked to, by Liz, preach at Breakwater Church out in Muskegon, and I don't think I would have said yes if I had not done FCA. So I'm, I'm glad that God allowed me to do FCA because uh, he led me to say yes to Liz when I was presented with the opportunity to preach at Breakwater. So this spring, I got to preach once already. Um, I'm not doing the same sermon, so if you were there at Breakwater, um, you're lucky, because I, I thought about doing the same sermon, but I chose to do something else. So that's my testimony. Um, every year, it feels like I grow deeper and deeper into my faith, and when you get opportunities like these, I think it's really important to say yes, or at least at least do some sort of way to serve. I'm, I like serving in the booth, but I feel like I connect and I grow deeper with God when I have opportunities like these. So again, thank you for allowing me to be up here. But that is my testimony. Shifting gears from my testimony, this morning what I would like to share about what God has put in my heart this week and over the past couple of weeks is the idea of prayer. And prayer is a, a probably the most common way to talk with God and have that communication with God. But this Sunday I'd just like to talk about the different aspects of prayer and the importance of it by answering a few questions. Sort of my context for doing this is um, 
I feel like, I mean, maybe you don't agree, but our church, more than any other church I've been to, has prayed phenomenally more. Um, sometimes I go to church with my friends out at Keystone, which is off of Fulton. I've been to Ab- Ada Bible before, and even at NYC, um, we, they just, they don't pray like we do. We pray um, a good 10, 15 minutes every Sunday, and when I was younger, I remember asking my mom, I don't know what to do when the pastor sits down and prays. I, I don't know if I should pray my own prayer, if I should listen to what he has to say. I didn't, I didn't understand the purpose when I was younger, and I just, thinking about how much we pray and thinking about that moment, today I'd like to share what I found out and read about in the Bible of the importance of prayer by answering these four questions. So if you're going to listen, (laughs) if you're taking notes or anything, think about these four questions as I share with you this morning. I want you to think about what is prayer, when should we pray, where should we pray, and why should we pray. So as I um, go in to answer these questions, um, I encourage you just to think about these and think about moments when you pray, times when you pray, and as you go into the week, think about how you pray. So first we have, what is prayer? Simply putting it, prayer is a time of communication with God. It's a moment in our day where we are deliberately creating a space for God, and we're opening our hearts and, um, you know, letting the presence of God come into us and move in us and allow us to either heal us or heal others. Again, we, we pray for interceding. We pray for people that don't know God. We pray for people who need healing. Prayer is just a good time for us to have that conversation with God, and the, the beautiful part about it is no matter where you are or how you're feeling or how alone you feel, someone is always there to listen to us, and that's what I really want to highlight right now when I'm answering the question, what is prayer? A conversation takes place with two people or, or more, but it takes listening and it takes talking, and although God wants to listen to us and he wants us to go to him when we have problems or requests, he also wants us to listen to him, and I think that's what I'm, it's what I'm trying to highlight when I talk about what is prayer, that it's not only us talking to God, but also us listening to what he has to say. More likely than not, God is going to answer our prayers in ways that we're not expecting or wanting or, or asking for. Um, you know, many times prayers go a- answered in mysterious ways, and we don't understand why, and uh, it's, a, it's a important for us to remember that not only are we talking to God and asking for us, but we also need to be listening, and we need to be listening for these unexpected prayers. And it doesn't happen immediately always, but he wants us to keep our ears and our hearts open for his answers to our prayers. And so we'll talk about God's will more later. But when answering the question, what is prayer, um, I just want you to think about it in one simple sentence. It's a time where we as followers open our hearts so that the presence of the Lord may enter and that we are able to talk with him but also listen to what the Lord has to say for us. Next, we're going to answer, when should we pray? Well, on Sundays, we pray before worship. We pray during offering. We pray to intercede. We pray for our community. We pray the Lord's Prayer together. We're going to pray for communion. We pray about everything we can on Sunday. And so, um, when should we pray should be a pretty common answer. We should pray always. But one passage that I would really like to highlight is Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, say, Through prayer, present your requests to God with thankfulness in all situations. So it's, it's easy for us to read that in all situations we should pray, but what I want to highlight is the thankfulness part. Common, commonly for our family, we pray before we go to trips, and a lingering thought that I had in mind is before we leave, we pray, but when we get there, how often do we remember to pray a prayer of thankfulness when we get there. It, when I'm writing my sermon, this is what I thought about over and over again, is oftentimes we pray when we're in need, but how often do we pray when we have stuff to be thankful for? It's easy to not pray when we're thankful because life is good, life is great. We're thinking that um, you know, we don't have anything to pray about just because everything is going well. So oftentimes we get wrapped up in the idea that We need to pray when we're in need, but I want to highlight right now, when should we pray? We should pray always, not when, not just when life is bad or when we need something or when others need something. We should pray when life is good as well. So keep that in mind. Not necessarily the same when you're going on a trip, pray before and when you get there, but kind of the concept of when you pray and God answers a prayer or 
when life is good, I want you to remember that you should pray with a foundation of thankfulness and not just a foundation of need. Next is where should we pray? Well, like when, when we pray, we should pray everywhere if we're going to pray anytime. That's pretty common. Idea is that everywhere we should pray, but there's one verse specific that I would like to highlight. It's a, a very common verse. I'm sure all of you have heard, for it, heard of it before, but in Matthew 6, starting in verse 5, it says, Go to your room and pray. Close the door and pray to the Father who is unseen. Do not be like the hypocrites who love to stand out on the corner to be seen by others. So I think this is very important. Our church will pray, like I just said, we'll pray over everything for the entire service together. But what I would like to highlight is that just as important as important as it is to pray with others and surround ourselves with a community like this, we should go and have that prayer and that connection with God on our own. Sorry. I told you I get really dry in the mouth when I speak out in public. But I think it's important for us to go in alone. As it's saying in this verse, go to your room and pray alone where you are unseen. Obviously, it's great to pray together like I was just saying. But God asks us to go and pray alone in our rooms so that we may have that one-on-one connection with God. God is unseen, so he asks that we as well be unseen when we have that connection with him. So answering just easily the question, where should we pray? You should pray everywhere, but it's just as important to pray alone where no one is seeing you, as well as praying here where everyone is around you. Sorry. Lastly, why should we pray? I think I've saved this one for last because it's the most important, but like I mentioned earlier, prayer is a time where we are opening up space for God to come, sorry, (laughs) and move in us, but there's more to it than just creating space for God. One of our many calls in the Bible is to live like Jesus did. And Jesus, being a, a, the human version of God, prayed continuously and directly. So if our goal is to be like Jesus, we should pray continuously and directly. And that's why we should pray. But going even further than that, um, like Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he ended all of his prayers with, Not my will be done but yours. And I think that's probably the most important reason of why we should pray is so that we come with acceptance with God that it's not our will and the things that we are asking for is not because of what we want, but it, we are praying so that God's will be done. And like Tyler prayed earlier, not our will, but your will, like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. Sorry. It's important for us to come to the accepting reality that when we pray and we ask for something, it's not going to be answered always the way that we want it to. More likely than not, it's not going to be answered the way that we want it to. The important part is that we are accepting that God's will is going to be done and that God's answers, God answers the way that fits his will. So in just one sentence, why should we pray? We should pray in order to be like Jesus, but also to come to peace with God's will and not what we want. So to wrap up my time, I want to share up share with you how praying has impacted my life and my testimony and my relationship with God. The first six months of this year were very stressful on my parents and I with trying to figure out college and where I would be spending the next four years of my life. Um, At the beginning of the year, I had successfully narrowed down my college search to just three colleges, but I knew at the end of the day that each of the colleges had immense opportunities for me that I would feel really bad about turning down. Each, each place was a special place in my mind, and no matter where I was going to go, I was going to be happy. But in March, our youth group took a trip to Lake Am Camp, and I prayed and prayed and prayed before we went there, and it was about the time where I needed to make a s- decision about where I was attending this fall. And I was praying to God, and I was just asking him by the end of the weekend, would you please make it clear to me about what college I should go to? And so I've only told this story once. I'm sorry if you were at Breakwater, you've already heard this story. But throughout the weekend, I was praying with God and just asking him to put it on my heart where I should be this, this fall. And a word that came up repeatedly during worship and during our lessons and every morning and every night, the word hope came, came up. Sorry. And repeatedly, I, I, I knew at the end of that weekend that Hope was going to be the place where I was going to spend the next four years. So I remember on the bus ride home just thanking God and praying to him that he does wonderful things and 
he answered the prayer like I wanted to, but I think it's important to remember that not all your prayers are going to be answered just how you want to. So um, I'm very happy that God put that on my heart. I'm happy that he put me on that trip. I knew it was all part of his will that I would be there and I would know where to spend the next four years of my life. Since that trip, I believe that my relationship with God has grown phenomenally. Just because I know now, unlike I did as a kid in the pew, the reason why we should pray. I have fully come to peace with his will, and I, it has become clear to me that it's not always going to be the way that I want it to. And more likely than not, it's not going to be the way that I want it to. But I know at the end of the day that God's will will be done. So now as you go out into this week, I encourage you to think about these things before you pray. I encourage you to open your heart so that God may come in, but also open your ears so that when you pray, you're not only talking to God, but you will also listen. I encourage you to think about praying with a foundation of thankfulness and not just a foundation of need. So praying when you're low and when life's not as good, but also praying when this week, when life is good and things are going the way that you want them to. I encourage you to pray with others like we do in church, but I also encourage encourage you to pray in solitude so that not only you know that you're alone, but God sees you praying alone. And lastly, I encourage you to pray in order to be like Jesus, to come with peace with his will, and to understand it's not our will that will be done, but his. Allow him to take the wheel. So as I wrap up, I'll invite Pastor Tyler back up so we can do communion. Um, but I would just like to pray over all you guys before we do so. So assume any position. If it's bowing your head and closing your eyes or coming up to the altar, I invite you to position yourself however you want to. So Lord, thank you for this day. You are the almighty God, Lord. I just, nothing compares to you. You do amazing, unspeakable things. You move even when we don't see you moving, God. I thank you for this opportunity. And I thank you for bringing everyone here today. God, I ask you that this week, everyone pray to you, whether that be with others or in solitude. I pray that we just, with the foundation of thankfulness and the foundation of praise, that we see your heart and we open our hearts for you to come into us, God. I ask that this week that we remember that it's not our will that needs to be done, but yours, God. Um, this week, I ask that you just be with us, bless our week, and... Sorry. Be with our future, God. Amen. Thank you, Sam. We heard uh, several great words in that this morning, and I trust that even through the sharing of his story, if you're sitting in here today, you'd be encouraged to say, yes, Lord that you would be encouraged to remain at peace with God's will in your life, to align yourself with him rather than to what you just want to do. Uh, Matt, can you go get the kids or whoever's going to get the kids so that they can join us for communion this morning? You've got some homework to do this week as well. I didn't ask Sam to do that, but he gave you some homework. Uh, he, he asked you to pray. He asked you to not just talk, but to listen. I'm not trying to re-preach. I'm just summing up what I heard. I don't, I don't need to re-preach. He, he did a fine job. He asked you to listen, not just talk. He asked you to go to your, to your quiet place. Spend some time alone with the Lord. See what happens when it's just you and God. He said, just pray always. That's the call from Scripture. There's not a certain time. Pray everywhere and all the time. And why? Why do we do it? We pray because Jesus did. We want to become more like him. And we pray so that we can become aligned with the will of God, at peace with the will of God in our lives. We cannot expect to know the will of God or to live into the will of God if we aren't listening to his voice tell us what it is. Thank you, Sam, for those words of encouragement and that homework this week. I trust each one will be an A student this week, and they'll give their, their time to responding to the message accordingly. 
We're just waiting for the kids. We do this intentionally. It doesn't have to be awkward. We're waiting for the kids. We wait for them because they belong at the table as well. We believe that wholeheartedly here at Sparta Naz, that if Jesus called his disciples to let the kids be around him, remember the disciples wanted the kids to be pushed away, and Jesus said, you, know, you guys are missing it. These are your examples of the faith in the kingdom. If Jesus said, let the children come to me, then we should make space for them as well. And so we do this many different ways, but one of those ways is every time we take communion, we welcome the kids to the table as well, that they might know the grace of God at an early age. And who am I to say how the Holy Spirit will speak to a child or to an adult, no matter the age, through the taking of the bread and the juice together? John Wesley called communion a means of grace, it's a way in which we experience the grace of God. We open up a pathway, essentially, by sitting at the table together for the grace of God to flow freely into our lives. And you know what happens when the grace of God intersects with our lives? We can't really guess what's going to happen next because we're almost always surprised by the grace of God. It's almost always more extravagant than we could ever imagine. This grace of God flows freely from God to us. He's ready to pour it out on us, even on Wesley. <laughs> oh, my. The kids are coming in, which means we can posture ourselves in a way that we are ready to sit at the table together. We do so intentionally and reverently and diligently so that we might know Christ further and identify with him in his sufferings so that as we leave this place, we might be able to, we just might be able to, by his grace, love like he loved the people around us. So I invite those that have volunteered to serve this morning to come and prepare themselves. The communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a sacrament which proclaims his life, his sufferings, his sacrificial death and resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. It shows forth the Lord's death until his return. The supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit. He's in this place. It's to be received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. All those who are truly repentant, forsaking their sins, and believing in Christ for salvation are invited to participate in the death and resurrection of Christ. We come to the table that we may be renewed in life and salvation and be made one by the Spirit. In unity with the church, we confess our faith in these words which we've learned to sing. Can we sing those together? Holy God, we gather at this, your table, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who by your Spirit was anointed to preach good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, set at liberty those who are oppressed. Christ healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners, and established the new covenant for forgiveness of sins. We live in the hope of his coming again. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we gather as the body of Christ to offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, God, and on these your gifts, the bread and the juice. Make them by the power of your Spirit to be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in the ministry of Christ to all the world until Christ comes in final victory. It's in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. At this time, when you are ready, please come forward and take the elements. Out to the left of your pews, down to the front, and around and take them back to your seat, and we'll take the elements together as a church family. I'm As I enter rest, I depend on you, I depend on you for eternal life to be raised with Christ. Close and 
Isn't it a great feeling to be welcome at the table? There's always a seat for you. Jesus welcomes you with open arms. He welcomes you, loving you enough to die for you, loving you enough to long to transform your life. He saved a seat for you. The elements we have in front of us, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving your creation, loving us so much that you would send your son to die for us. Jesus, thank you for emptying yourself even though you could have counted equality with God something to be grasped, instead you humbled yourself, you emptied yourself and became like us and became obedient to God the Father, even to the point of death on a cross. Thank you, Jesus, for remaining obedient. Even in the struggle, as you prayed that it would not be that this cup could pass from you, Thank you for submitting yourself to the will of God the Father for our sake. Holy Spirit, thank you for joining us and reminding us of this truth. Thank you for continuing the transformative work of Jesus in our lives today. For sanctifying and cleansing us so that we might love just as Christ loved so we might live just as Christ lived. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are grateful for you and your actions, your persons, who you are, for the salvation that you provide. May we keep these truths on our hearts and minds daily. May we always remember that you loved us enough to die for us. We pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Would you stand today to receive the benediction? Thank you again to Sam for filling in today, for Bethany for filling in last week. I appreciate both of you and the word and the attention you gave to the word and the care you gave to our congregation. I appreciate that. Receive this benediction today. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely so that your whole soul, body, and mind would be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you to it is faithful, and he will do it. And so as we go back to the places where we've been planted, back to the people that we've been called to love, may we go and live in this reality that we confess so willingly and excitedly, Jesus is alive. You are the church, and you are sent out.